coming up. The most important thing that we've learned is that change is here to stay. Disruptions will happen. What is the world that I live in today requiring of me that is different? I may think of myself as the head and therefore I may put a lot of pressure on myself to have all the answers. Well, nobody has all the answers in in a foggy system that we're sort of making it up as we go along. And so what shifts do I need to make within myself first? Today on In Session, Leading the Judiciary, we explore how disruption will influence the future of work, creating opportunities for positive change. Author of Wired for Disruption, The Five Shifts in Agility to Lead in the Future of Work, Henna Enam says that we already have the skills we need to thrive through increasing uncertainty and upheaval. By understanding our biological reactions to disruption, we can become more agile to adapt, innovate, and move ourselves, our employees, and our organizations from survival mode to success. Hannah Enam founded Transformational Leadership Incorporated and has helped Fortune 500 organizations like Google, Coca-Cola, and Microsoft develop leaders who create cultures of innovation, trust, and inclusion. Henna's 20-year career in leadership includes time as the chief marketing officer for a $2 billion global business. Henna earned her Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Texas at Austin and her MBA from the Wharton School. Our host is Lori Murphy, Assistant Division Director for Executive Education at the FJC. Lori, take it away. Well, welcome, Henna. We're so happy to have you. Uh, It's a pleasure for me to be here. You know, disruption is a scary word to many leaders, and I'd like you to help us understand what disruption means in the world of work and why leaders should embrace a future full of disruption. Well, let me start by saying, yes, it is a scary word. Um, And it's scary because of our neurobiology, right? Disruption is an unanticipated change And whenever we as humans experience unanticipated change, our spidey senses go off. And so we get into this fight flight mode. We as a species survived because we had this spidey sense and respond, our body, our brain responds to disruption. And coming back to your question about, you know, disruption and what we can be doing in the face of the disruption of the pandemic and all the things that have happened as a result of that. I think it's really useful for us to view disruption as an opportunity to evolve. I believe that the job of every leader is to of course, notice the disruption, of course, notice what's arising in them in terms of fear, but then figure out how they can shift themselves from states of fear and threat into states of creativity and collaboration and curiosity. We do have threat, as you said, we do have a lot of disruption. What are the effects of disruption, both positive and negative on us as individuals and as uh, an organization? Yeah, so obviously the, the we'll start with the negative because those are the ones that our body and mind notice first. Um, we get into um, fear states. And when we get into fear and stressful states as human beings, our uh, stressed behaviors show up in the workplace, right? And for some, that means we shut down and we just feel stuck and we feel confused. So there's some space we have to create for compassion for that. So there's these very real emotions that happen and that impacts not only us, but the teams within which we work. You hear some horror stories of toxic world cultures that have happened as a result of this fear. As a leader, when your your behaviors impact, even your state of being impacts the culture that you're in. And then there's a positive, you know, we are built as humans for agility. And this kind of disruption that we're individually and collectively faced with actually creates an enormous opportunity for us to become much more mindful and develop new muscles to switch on that capacity, that innate capacity we have to switch ourselves from states of threat 
to states of creativity and curiosity and collaboration. This is a, an enormous opportunity for us to redefine what leadership is, who leaders are and what they do, and to have a, a conversation about that. You mentioned agility, and that's what your book is mostly about, right? Overcoming that threat response that we feel. In your book, you identify five different types of agility, neuroemotional, learning, growth, trust, and stakeholder. I'd like to talk about each one because they're distinct and important for us to understand. So let's start with neuroemotional agility, which I think gets to that innate human basic response that you were talking about. So what is neuroemotional agility and how do we develop it? The first thing we do is lead ourselves. And in leading ourselves, it's really important to figure out like, who am I being right now in this moment? And what is that impact on the person that is sitting in front of me, regardless of where I'm in the hierarchy? This state of threat is a survival mechanism. Our goal here is to recognize when it's happening. So when is it feeling like, boy, my body is really revved up? Or when is it feeling like, you know, my muscles are really tight, um, which means to me signals stress and threat state. So recognizing as leaders that I'm in a threat state now, what do I do with that? There are actually 15 agility accelerators that I talk about in the book. So one of the tools that I want to talk about is a tool that is called self-compassion. As soon as you recognize that, wow, I am in this high stress state, you hold your hands to your heart as if to sort of say, I'm right here. When you hold your hands to your heart, it can reassure your body that you're safe. And then you repeat to yourself, this is a difficult moment. Difficult moments are part of being human. May I be kind to myself. And just continuing to be with yourself in a really compassionate way have been proven in lots of research to help us be more resilient. It sounds like that's a way to get us a little bit, at least, out of that threat state and into a more productive, creative state. As you get calmer and more centered, that has an enormous benefit to your team. The other tool that I often share for neuroemotional agility is what I call the purpose accelerator. What is it that matters to us? As a leader, our job is to connect with our own purpose, but then also connect with what is this team that I am working on and what is a collective purpose that everybody can aspire toward that really energizes us? Because now we're no longer thinking of our threat state, but creating an aspiration or a dream that we want to make possible together. So neuroemotional agility, we want to notice our threat state, we want to center ourselves, we want to connect with our purpose. I'd like to focus next on learning and growth agilities. They're similar, but distinct. How do you distinguish them and why do we need both? Yeah, so to me, learning agility is our capacity to learn, unlearn, and relearn, right? And within that, Unlearning is what's so important. Unlearning is changing a mindset. There's this fantastic um, tool that I write about in the book. It's called the Kinevin Framework. And the Kinevin Framework actually shares, you know, four different landscapes within which we exist and make decisions. There's sort of a simple and predictable landscape in which we're solving problems. One plus one equals two. There's clarity. It's often, you know, now automated, right? It doesn't require human intervention to solve those problems. Then there are complicated problems. And complicated problems are things that require a little bit more work. You know, we might need some consultants to help us figure this thing out. It requires more thinking. Then there are complex problems. And complex problems often happen when the cause and effect aren't really known. So there's not really clarity, like how to solve the problem of hybrid work, 
because it involves human beings. The cause and effect are there, but we can't really, our, our simple brains can't process it. Uh, in the same way as one plus one equals two, there's no rules. And so when you're operating in complexity like that, it requires a change in mindset. And that's unlearning. So where as a leader, I used to be able to work in a hierarchy and tell the people, here's what you need to do because I am the expert. Now it's like, you know, it's like two different cars. It's one car is driving around on a highway that is really well lit and everything is clear. And then another car is driving in fog. You've got your headlights on, but you can't see. And that's what complex problems are. And in that, we need access to new forms of intelligence. We need a different mindset. We're not going to hurdle down that highway, right? We have to slow down. We have to sense. We have to notice. We have to ask the people in the back seat, what do you see? Here's what I'm seeing. And so it's a very different way of leading than in the past. And that's what we have to unlearn individually and collectively. We have to be able to lean on the systems that we're in and learn from others and start to get curious. That's what success looks like because you're operating now in a foggy state rather than in a clear, well-lit state. So sticking with learning agility here for a moment, what impact do our biases have or our professional histories have on us being adept at unlearning and being agile? Yeah, so when I was writing the book, I was doing research on biases, and it seems that we collectively as human beings have, they've documented between two and 300 different biases we have. One of the most critical biases that is a trap when we get into complex situations is the bias to believe what I think. <laughs> it's like, I'm the expert. Let me see. Let me tell you, here's what I see. And I, by the way, there's also this bias, like if I'm a leader, I have to be the expert, right? There's an expectation that we put on ourselves. And people, quite frankly, are often promoted because they are good at the job below the official level of leader. Correct. Correct. So I am an excellent salesperson, right? And therefore I get promoted to be the sales leader. And so... I've been promoted because I consider myself an expert and the organization has validated that I'm an expert. And in complex situations, expertise, which is me deciding my point of view is really important and must be followed, will get you killed, right? Because you're not tapping into the expertise and the, the thinking and the seeing um, of others in the system that you're operating in. So it can give you a, a false sense of um, security. Which I think leads us to growth agility, which is really experimentation, letting others in the mix, bringing others in to solve these complex problems. So what does growth agility look like now that we understand a little bit more about learning agility? Yeah, growth agility is our ability to grow ourselves and others. So some of that is confronting our own biases and, and, and evolving ourselves to be more humble. So it's not just growth in the form of what do I know or what do I not know, but it's also growth in the form of how do I see their world? How do I see others? How can I help them grow themselves? if somebody has failed, because in complex situations, it's like failure is inevitable because we, there's no rules of the game yet, right? There's no playbook for this. So the way you create the playbook is by experimenting. And so how do I create a culture of experimentation? And how is it that I can create a safe space of psychological safety so that when somebody fails, they don't consider themselves a failure? We've just failed in this experiment. And now what did we learn? Let's celebrate that. And let's get on with the next experiment. That's hard, especially in a, an environment like ours, the judiciary, a, a very precedent-bound, 
uh, hierarchical organization where there are a lot of rules and expertise is really celebrated. What could experimentation look like in an environment like ours, where historically we have not always been good at allowing failure Hmm. or celebrating failure? All that is for good reason. And so I think the first place to start is to slow down, to actually ask, you know, what environment am I in right now for this challenge or problem or situation that I'm trying to address? Even having a conversation with the colleagues in the room to say, using the Kinevin framework, to say, what is this we're trying to solve for? Which kind of highway are we on right now? And then adjusting your approach to the kind of highway that you're on. What I hear you say is that that's another way we need to go against our perhaps innate way of working. How have leaders in your experience pivoted from, you know, go, go, go to slowing down, given the demands on them for lots of decisions to be made, lots of problems to be solved, et cetera? I think the short short answer is uh, not well enough. Right. And and that's the reason why we have the great resignation. That is the reason why so many of us are burned out. We're trying to run fast to catch up to the problem that is just out of reach. When we are slowing down, even in a foggy situation, we're able to see a little bit better than when we speed up. You know, during the pandemic, I did a lot of talks on this book. I would start by asking one simple question. Name two emotions that you're feeling. And inevitably, it actually didn't matter which company, which function, which date. It was, I feel burned out. I feel exhausted. I feel tired. Hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. And I ask you, How many times as leaders, what a great opportunity for you to just simply check in. How are you feeling today? What can I do to support you? Instead, we rush to solving the problem. And one of the tools in the book I talk about is called a listening tool. It's four levels of listening. And we actually do this exercise on Zoom where we break break out into breakout rooms. And within six minutes of two people sharing a challenge they have and the other person listening and then switching, I ask them the same two questions. How are you feeling? And the answers are completely different. I feel connected. I feel cared for. I feel curious. I feel relieved that I'm not the only one who's feeling like this. This is why slowing down is important. And once that feeling of stuckness is released, then we can be creative. We can be, you know, collaborative with one another. We can all be in the same boat. Sure, we're kind of hurtling down, right, this rapids, but we're in the same boat and we're traveling together. And there's a feeling of comfort and safety in that because I've got these teammates who've got my back and I've got theirs. Those of us who started to do this during this great time of disruption, during the pandemic, checking in on one another, it sounds like that's something we should continue to do as a way to sustain this growth agility, learning agility, our own neuro-emotional agility. Absolutely. I believe that the best leaders who have really created outstanding breakthroughs and will continue to create outstanding breakthroughs in times of disruption are leaders who know how to connect to themselves, leaders who know how to connect with others, and leaders who know how to connect collectively to purpose. I think that's our work and the evolution of leadership. A lot of what you're talking about really gets to a culture of trust. And I know another type of agility you talk about in your book is trust agility. And I was struck by 
uh, this is a quote from your book, in high trust cultures, people are nine times more likely to adapt to a new way of working. So how do you define a high trust culture? And beyond what you've already shared, what else can we do to help cultivate one? A lot of the way we see our work colleagues is as a way to get my goals met, which is what's really important to me, rather than seeing them as human beings that have their own desires and wishes and dreams and fears. And how do we get really curious about that person that's sitting in front of us? We have to sort of give up this desire for efficiency. Efficiency can be fantastic when you are on that highway that's clean and clear and you're going 100 miles an hour and things are great and visibility is good. But when you're in a foggy landscape, it's not the smartest thing to do. Anna, you mentioned that disruption exacerbates already existing trust issues and our biases encourage us to be more careful during times of uncertainty. How do we overcome those tendencies as leaders? Mindsets are basically habits, habitual ways of thinking and acting. But in this environment, in this new problem or challenge that I'm faced with, how is that going to serve me? And what do I need to be doing differently? I have to actually slow down to notice or even just say, now let's slow down. Here's what I'm seeing. What are you seeing? What are the assumptions that we're making here? I had a very courageous um, client who is the head of HR in her organization actually decide that she was going to arrive at a meeting with 30 HR leaders and arrive and give herself three minutes of silence and others three minutes because they run from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. And they're not really here to make the decisions because they're thinking about something that happened over there and something that ha needs to happen in the future. And so allowing everybody to just arrive and be there together and calm themselves down was like a big act of courage. The last type of agility, Hennett, that you talk about is stakeholder agility. What that seems to mean is widening the lens on who can be co-creators with us uh, what does this new vision of stakeholders look like and how do we find and engage them? I wanted to talk about stakeholder agility because as we get into more sustainable impact, we're now starting to think about, wow, I've got to think about my clients. I've got to think about my employees. I've got to think about communities in which I operate. So I think this makes it more complex. Right? Because each one of them has might have slightly different needs. Opening up our aperture to look at, here's who are all the people, here's a system within which I'm operating, and what are the individual needs of each of these people, and how do I make sure that I understand and listen with empathy to what those needs are, so that we can collectively move ourselves forward in a much more sustainable way. A big skill set in stakeholder agility is actually listening. So actually connecting with the people who even oppose you, because if they're part of your system, there's something that they're wanting and needing from you so that you can learn from them about how the system needs to evolve to fit the needs of all the stakeholders that are part of the system. So similar to what you talked about internal to the organization, we need to do that externally as well. I think so. How do we listen to the needs of all of the players to enable the evolution of the system? Particularly the voices that aren't often heard. And they could have ideas that, because they haven't been heard, could really make a difference. So, Henny, you, you say we must be able to change at the pace of disruption. And really, that's what we've been talking about, these types of agility to deal with disruption. How do these 
five types of agility sort of all together help us change at the pace of disruption? What's important is starting with mindset. I think re-examining kind of the mindset of who am I? What do I think I'm here to do? And what is the world that I live in today requiring of me that is different than my current identity? You know, I may think of myself as the head and therefore I may put, you know, put a lot of pressure on myself to have all the answers. Well, nobody has all the answers in, in a foggy system that we're sort of making it up as we go along. And so what shifts do I need to make individually within myself first? And that's important regardless of whether you're at the top of the hierarchy or the bottom of the hierarchy. Shifting away from agility for a moment and looking at this new workplace, right? We're, we're emerging from a pandemic. What does the new workplace look like in your mind? The most important thing that we've learned is that change is here to stay, disruptions will happen, whether it's um, social justice issues, whether it's climate, whether it's new pandemics, disruptions will happen. AI technology is hugely disrupting, right? And so that's the first thing to know is disruptions will continue to happen. As individuals, we're going to need to learn how to be agile and that agility is inbuilt in us. So we have these mechanisms, turn a switch on from threat to curiosity and, and creativity. And our job is to individually and collectively to learn. You know, that's, that's what we've done, we've evolved, right? So our job is to be able to evolve, to meet the needs of the future that we're creating together. I was struck by, when I read your book, that you modeled the behavior, the curiosity, the humility by publishing your book really quickly, just putting it out there as quickly as possible for reaction and collaboration. I wonder if you can talk about what it was like to do that, to model this agility that you discuss. It was scary. Between Starting to write the book and publishing it on Amazon, it took exactly three months. Wow. And I would wake up in the mornings, 5 a.m. in cold sweat, like, what am I doing? <laughs> and what if they think it's completely stupid? <laughs> and who am I to, you know, do this? And what I kept turning myself back to is my purpose. I wanted to practice what I wrote about, which is, yes, there is fear and doubt and stress. And yes, it's possible to move ourselves from that to the purpose and to also say, look, this isn't the final word and that we're figuring this out as we go along. But here's my contribution to what we're figuring out. So, Hannah, what else would you like to share with us today? I want to share that... Everything that you need to navigate disruption is within you. We're built for this and we know how to navigate it. And when we dip into our humanity, not just our rational brains, but our hearts, the power of purpose, the connection that we feel when we really connect with one another, we as a species can create a sustainable experience of life on this planet. Where can we learn more about you and your work? I think the best place to go is actually to go try out the agility quiz on my website. It's at www.transformleaders.tv as in television. And please find me on LinkedIn. If you listen to this and it intrigued you, please connect with me. And importantly, if you have some feedback for me on the book, please reach out to me. Excellent. Well, Hannah, it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. I'm going to be putting my hands over my heart and taking some deep breaths and slowing down. And I have you to thank for that. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Lori. And thanks to our listening audience. 
To hear more episodes of this podcast, visit the Executive Education page at fjc.dcn and click or tap Podcast. You can also search for and subscribe to this podcast on your mobile device. In Session, Leading the Judiciary is produced by Shelley Easter. Our program is supported by Angela Long, Anna Gloshkova, and the entire studio and live production team. Thanks for listening. Until next time. This podcast was produced at U.S. taxpayer expense.